everyone, I'm Jamie. And just to give some context for my research, before I came to Chile, I worked at a data visualization startup, got really interested in programming, and I've always loved teaching, so this project was a mixture of my two interests. <clears throat> and um, the inspiration was Startup Chile. Chile brings early stage te tech companies to the country. And I wanted to focus on the education piece. How do we educate students for roles in the technology sector here? And I broke my project up into three phases. First, I wanted to understand if there is a skill gap, um, what are companies looking for, and then how can we teach these skills in public schools. And second, uh, during phase two, I wanted to understand the educational landscape and how I could fit in there. And then I spent the bulk of my time conducting 10 case studies. I worked with public schools and organizations here in Chile, um, teaching workshops and designing solutions for the classroom. So quantifying the skill gap. First, what are companies looking for? I looked at Laborum data, which is Chile's job posting site. And of the technology jobs, pro everyone's looking for programmers right now. And when I looked at the education side, and just a quick note here, I'm focusing, if you remember from my first presentation, I'm focusing on high schools because when you look at what makes a country good for innovation and um, technology, there's kind of uh, one group did this study, there's nine entrepreneurial framework conditions, and Chile's lowest score was in early education. So I wanted to focus on high schools as opposed to universities. And as a proxy for what is emphasized in the public school system, I looked at the specialties offered by vocational schools here. And this is from 2012, but programming wasn't offered. It's since been added as a specialty in vocational schools. But you can kind of see there's a little bit of a mismatch between what people want and what's being offered, or uh, what's being taught. And during phase two, I kind of uh, just wanted to understand how public education works here in Chile. And again, I looked at some publicly available data. This is from the Ministry of Education. And I looked at performance in math just to see how schools perform in a quantitative subject area. And one of the things that was interesting is um, across income levels, uh, schools tend to perform similarly. So here, if you look at medium income, it doesn't really matter that it's a public school or if it receives some money from families, it's gonna have similar student performance. Uh, so that was interesting. And then I also cut the data geographically and I was able to confirm what I'd been hearing in interviews, which is that there's a huge difference between the schools in Santiago and the schools outside, outside of Santiago. And um, that made me interested in low resource public schools in rural areas. I, I felt I could have a bigger impact uh, in these types of educational settings. And like I said, this is where I spent the bulk of my time. I actually uh, went out to public schools and taught workshops and then worked with organizations that shared my goals here in Chile. And a quick note here, I broke the case studies into three different groups. So first, I started with creating curriculum and testing how that worked in the classrooms. Second, I started making educational games to teach computational thinking uh, concepts. And then finally, I did some work training teachers for how they could bring technology into the classroom. Um, so starting with curriculum, uh, I worked with Jovenes Programadores, which is a initiative from the library network here. And they offer these one-off workshops for schools to come to a space like Telefonica and introduce students to programming. Students who've never written a line of code, um, it's very introductory. <coughs> and I used an application called Scratch just to tell you guys how it works. It's an application developed by MIT that um, is designed to get students up and running quickly. So I frequently describe it as these are kind of the Legos, and they're like puzzle pieces with little snippets of code, and here you can build your program, and the program renders here. 
So this is the workshop I would teach in the beginning, and the kids would build a game where the users this fish and they have to escape from the shark. And they could build that in about an hour. Uh, it was really fun. <laughs> and then second, my second case study, I worked with Technovation Challenge, which is a global competition where teams of girls compete to build an app that solves a problem they've seen in their community. We, these girls wanted to make a health app that gives you recipes based on your health needs. And I think this really opened my eyes to how effective project-based learning is. As opposed to a one-hour, one-off workshop, these girls were working over the course of a year, having to learn a variety of different skills. And, and um, I thought the project aspect was interesting. And then my third case study, I, this was the first case study where I developed and tested my own curriculum. And I worked with a school in Talagante, and I brought a short film just because uh, if you could play the, the YouTube clip. Um, I can describe it all I want, but this is actually what it looked like uh, working in the schools. <laughs> a research project. The way I would describe it is um, my project tries to show students that they can. My goal of my workshops is to have students realize it's not as challenging as they anticipate it. And a lot of times I'll see the students try and run their program and they see that maybe their fish is moving or the thing they've programmed is working and I'll see them be motivated by that and you kind of see their faces light up. So. Okay, and then you might want to cancel it or I'm, you're going to hear my voice again. <laughs> that was another video that I made for teachers. But, uh, yeah, that was what it was like working in a public school. You can see they have a computer lab. And, um, yeah, just a little taste of. And then I got in touch with the director of English Opens Doors at the beginning of my project. And over the winter coding camp or the winter camps they wanted to do a camp that not only teaches English but teaches programming and English at the same time so the multidisciplinary approach was interesting because we're not teaching English hypothetically you're asking students to apply their knowledge of English to learn programming and the students we worked with Vex IQ robots the first week and then more with Scratch the second week and this robot would pick up trash and put it in the trash receptacle. And then uh, on the second week, we got to present our robots to, is it Chile's still current president? Yeah, she's, she, it's, she still has a little bit more time. So that was <laughs> awesome. <coughs> and, and then I finally got out of Santiago and I worked with a really talented English teacher in Escuela Cahuil. And we wanted to use programming as a tool for teaching English. So she had this book from the Ministry of Education of concepts that she needed to cover. She had to teach a unit on environmental threats. And then we came up with a project where the students would have to use their English vocabulary about environmental threats and program a game in Scratch that shows how this environmental threat is affecting Pichalemo. And the, the students, this was really fun to have kind of a longer format um, engagement with the students and work with them over a period of uh, eight classes. And yeah, lo pasamos super bien. <laughs> and <clears throat> educational games. So I got, I loved Scratch, but you need computers to use Scratch. So how could we teach computer science when we don't have computers? And one of the things I notice in the classroom is that the final minutes of class are usually left unutilized. As a teacher, I'm so tired, and the students are restless, and um, me and the myself and the English teacher in Kawil, we design these 10-minute activities that could be used uh, for teachers when they have these 10 minutes left in class and don't know what to do. And each activity focuses on a computational thinking concept. So 
Some of them were focused around design challenges, thinking through user experience, debugging activities, and um, they're meant to be just self-contained, and uh, these are available online. Teachers can print them out and use them. And then I just wanted to highlight a little bit of the process here. So I, I was initially set on making an offline version of Scratch, and if you remember those little blocks of code that I showed you, my initial prototype was, okay, I'm going to make little paper versions of those blocks and the students would arrange them on their desk and they would be writing code. And it was a huge failure because <laughs> students need to see the output of their code and there's nothing uh, compiling it. And then I did another prototype where um, the whole class arranged these larger blocks of paper that had instructions on them and the goal was that they would try and get me to move through a maze. So I would be the compiler. And it wasn't, that activity was also not very successful. And then I came around to this idea of a card game and this flips the idea on its head. So in this card game, the students act as the computers and they read and interpret the code. And in the game, the code is a series of rules and algorithms that make the card game increasingly complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just an um, offline way of getting students to think like a computer and understand how computers interpret commands. And then finally, I spoke at the Scratch Al Sur conference. And the goal of this conference is just to get Scratch into the classrooms. Uh, we, I, I specifically gave a workshop for English teachers and how, how they could use Scratch to teach English. Um, I think this was really rewarding because I felt the physical limitations of I could only go to these classrooms, but um, at the conference, hopefully these teachers will bring back Scratch and um, these concepts into their own teaching methodologies. So this was a really rewarding experience as well. And then finally, I wanted to answer my initial research question. How can we close the skill gap with early education? And this is a huge question. I don't pretend to know all the answers, but I wanted to share some of the things I've learned over the past nine months. So one of the things that I learned is teachers are the limiting factor. Actually, in public schools in Chile, there are computer labs, and um, students do have access to computers. But teachers are the ones that might feel intimidated by technology and, and not want to create curriculum that uses these computers. So it's important to empower teachers, make sure they have the tools, the confidence to teach with technology. Um, but even in an unplugged setting, we can still teach computational thinking. There's games that we can play so that students know um, get some degree of computational literacy. And it's best when we start early. So computer languages are languages. It's best to introduce students um, as early as possible so they can kind of bake these into how they uh, think about the world and how they um, interact with computers. And these are fifth graders in Pichalemu and they're already programming in Scratch. And I'm going to connect this, I swear. Um, I volunteered with Valpo Surf Project, and we take kids from vulnerable cerros in Valparaiso surfing. And I actually see teaching programming and teaching surfing as very similar because both are perceived to be really difficult. And when you get students doing something that they like, that they didn't think was possible, you can build confidence and they start to experiment in other aspects of their life as this ripple effect. And um, I've been really inspired by Seymour Papert and the constructionist theory of learning, which is that students learn by doing and when you give students a sandbox where they can experiment and ask questions and be the own drivers of their um, learning experience, it's far more effective than spoon feeding. And my my inclination when I first started teaching was to 
feed everything in bite-sized chunks and make sure every single student was exactly with me and I found that it's been so much more effective to throw students into the deep end give them something really hard and I've constantly been surprised by how much they can do fifth graders this week was awesome Sorry, what was the name of the person what uh the Seymour Papert P-A-P-E-R-T and he also was the great grandfather of Scratch so he created this logo programming robot um and that and it would draw, and students could program what the robot would draw, and this became the early, the precursor to Scratch, which also takes into account these um, uh, concepts. And I might need, oh wait, yeah, okay. Um, and all of my uh, research and the games that I made or the, the things that I found from teaching are, are published on my website for anyone to use. Um, open source, always good. And I wanted to say thank you so much to Fulbright and my research mentor, Professor Castaneda, and also the people at the embassy who helped me with contacts and getting into schools. Um, I felt super inspired this year, I'm sure everyone has, and love being um, kind of the boss of my own project and um, I'm not really ready to let it go, so <laughs> I'm going to stay in, in Chile for another year, and I want to spend the next year creating a design thinking course where high schoolers kind of come together and um, with the schools that they have and, and do some hands-on learning of new skills and try and solve problems in Pichilema, where I live now, um, that I call home. And Thank you so much. This has been an incredible experience. Thank you so much, Jamie. We have uh, time for questions. You're very under. Do you think you're going to um, stay in contact with the teachers you did the uh, How to Teach Scratch as a Second Language workshop? Do you think you'll keep in contact with them, hear about results and follow up? Yeah, so I kept in contact with them on Facebook, and a bunch of them um, had doubts about their ability to... We did the hands-on workshop, so they built something in Scratch when I taught them, and they were a little skeptical about, okay, how do I bring this back and teach it when I'm still a little shaky with Scratch? So I made a, a video that I sent out to them, and then the teachers were from all over Latin America, so some of them I've connected with online, and um, one teacher that I met at the conference lives in Pichilemu too, so I was able to work with her fifth graders, and that, that was um, my last case study. And um, yeah, it's mostly been keeping contact through Facebook. A bunch of people reached out to me and asked for the slides, um, and I think since I am gonna keep working on education over the next year, I'll definitely keep in contact with them. <laughs> when students leave um, like the classroom setting, what kind of resources do they have to continue practicing their skill? So my fifth graders have been asking for the, the downloaded Scratch program, and they can get it on a pen drive and put it on their computer at home, even if they don't have Wi-Fi. And Scratch is cool because um, you can experiment, and as you're playing and, and trying to find out how to do new things you're learning. Um, and then also, I, the Jovenes Programadores is a really good resource because it's a free online course that starts with Scratch, and then it does App Inventor, and I want to say there's one other thing, but it's, it's a pretty long course, and students can, um, yeah, that's like an initiative from Chile that students can keep working with. Um, but I would say the Scratch community is pretty good. For the age of kids that I'm working with, you can build really complex stuff in Scratch, like Mario Karts, or um, there's Pokemon Go built in <laughs> completely in Scratch. So it, it can really uh, go far. And, and one of the theories behind Scratch is that Papert said that you should have low... Um, uh, low floor, wide walls, and high ceilings, so you should be able to start easily, low floor, 
wide walls, you should be able to build a ton of different things. And um, high ceiling, you should be able to build complex things. So I, I'm a big fan of Scratch for students who want to continue programming. And what about, like, do you find a lot of students without computer at home or access to computer? Um, yeah, it's mostly the internet is a problem. And the other thing that I've done is most students who don't have computers at home have smartphones. And there's a couple good applications like Hopscotch, I think, is one of them uh, where students can do programming activities at home. Okay. <coughs> oh, just one more from Congratulations, Jane, for your presentation. Is it, you remember the interview with uh, eBay, IBM uh, candidate manager? Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, what do you think? The bad results, poor results, and, and uh, in general, in public school, in TE, in different subjects, is uh, what is it, your perception connecting with the interview? Yeah. With I think it's, it's interesting to, to comment here with your mate. Totally. So I interviewed the head of HR at IBM, and I was asking him about his um, perspective on hiring here in Chile, uh, and if there's certain skills that he wish wishes were easier to find here. And one of the things that he pointed out is the level, the skill level in Chile is super high. If you're hiring a programmer or um, like a I don't know, any type of technical skill, you can find really high candidates, but there's just not enough of them. So it's about widening the pipeline, and and then this didn't really come from that interview, but I think widening the pipeline means widening the pipeline not just from universities where students are privileged to be at the universities, but widening the pipeline from the vocational schools, which are traditionally lower income, people who don't go to university, they should have the opportunity to learn to program too. It shouldn't just be like something that's taught to very um, wealthy people or people who have the privilege of going to university. Thank you so much.